our special guest today. Layton W. Smith Jr. was born in Mobile, Alabama, graduated from the Naval Academy with the class of 1962, and received his wings in January 1964. He retired from active service in October 1996 with the rank of Admiral. As a naval aviator, Admiral Smith is noted in Navy circles by his call sign, Snuffy, who carrier based late attack jet aircraft during local deployments to the Mediterranean, North Atlantic, Western Pacific, and Indian Oceans over 280 combat missions, has logged over 4,200 flying hours and over 1,035 carrier arrested landings. Appointed to his four-star rank at, in April 1994, he became Commander-in-Chief U.S. Naval Forces Europe and Commander-in-Chief Allied Forces Southern Europe. In December of 1995, he assumed concurrently command of NATO-led implementation force I-4 in Bosnia, a position he held until August 1996. Admiral Smith's military awards include two Defense Distinguished Service Medals, the Navy Distinguished Service Medal, three Legion of Merits, two Distinguished Flying Crosses, two Meritorious Service Medals, and 29 Air Medals. He's also received the Order of Merit of the Republic of Hungary, the French Order of National Merit with the rank of Grand Officer, and on the 5th of March, 1997, he was made an Honorary Knight of the British Empire in a private audience with Her Majesty the Queen. Among his several endeavors, Admiral Smith served as a distinguished fellow at the Center for Naval Analysis and has been a member of several boards of trustees or directors of both charitable institutions and major corporations. In 2007, he was selected as a distinguished graduate of U.S. Naval Academy at institution's most prestigious award. It is my honor to introduce you to my grandfather, retired four-star Admiral Leighton Smith, also known as Sir Snuffy. Well, that's one of the nicest introductions I've ever had, but he forgot to tell you something. My real claim to fame is that I made the upper 95% of my class at the Naval Academy look good. <laughs> now, i got to tell you that Dr. Mueller told me this morning that he read the chapter in the book A Better Man, and his first concern is, oh my gosh, we're going to have a guy that's going to come up here who never made anything better than a C in his life, and he succeeded, so everybody in this high school is going to think they can get by with C's. That isn't true. Okay, I made a B one time. <laughs> but I was a horrible student. I was probably the worst student in Mobile, Alabama. And I didn't do much better when I went to the University of Alabama for one year. And the reason was quite simple. I was lazy. <clears throat> I didn't like studying. I much preferred hunting, fishing, being outside. Didn't pay too much attention to what was going on in the school. And not surprisingly, I scraped by. In fact, the assistant principal in our high school told my father that Leighton Smith is probably the only person that ever talked his way through high school. So if you can't be good at grades, be good at talking. That's my advice to you. So I went off to the University of Alabama, not because I had any idea what I wanted to do with my life, except I did not want to be a farmer. I knew that. We had lived on a farm for a couple of years in the early days of my high school. And it was a miserable existence. I mean, I'm not saying anything about farming is good and we need farmers, but it just wasn't for me. In any event, I went off to the University of Alabama with all of my buds who went up there. And I spent the first year at the University of Alabama doing exactly what I did in high school. Nothing. <laughs> I didn't study, and not surprisingly, I didn't make very good grades. Well, about November, I came home for Thanksgiving, and my father said to me, you know, Congressman Boykin is going to make his appointments to the United States Naval Academy in February, and have you ever thought about doing that? Well, I hadn't, really. My uncle had been a naval officer and had gone to the Naval Academy, and I was kind of impressed with his uniform, and he was a pretty important guy, so I thought, you know, that may be kind of fun. Uniforms, girls like uniforms. And I knew that if I stayed in college, I was going to have to work my way through because my father didn't have enough money to send me to college. And that didn't sound like a too attractive thing, so I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to give it a try. So I came home over Christmas, and I went around, and I, I, I called on virtually everybody that I could think of to write letters of recommendation to the congressman to make me his principal appointee to the Naval Academy. 
Now, I told you before that my dad didn't have any money, but we had been mobilians for quite some period of time, and our family was well known. So we had a lot of people there that were good friends of ours, and I went to see doctors and lawyers and ministers and teachers and virtually everybody I could think of, and I ended up getting 63 letters of recommendation sent to Congressman Boykin. They all said about the same thing. What they didn't say, but what I saw in their eyes when I asked them if they would write a letter of recommendation for me, was I'll do this for you and everybody later. This is something that's way above your ability to do. You'll go to the Naval Academy, but you'll fail. I even had one of my high school teachers. She was my geometry teacher. She said, Layton, I'll be happy to write a letter for you, but I can absolutely guarantee you you'll be home within six months. There's no way you will succeed. Well, I went back up to the university and I tried to get a couple of my professors up there to write letters of recommendation for me. Two of them flat refused, and one of them said, I'll write one for you, but you'll never make it. In February, I got a call from the congressman's office, and, it, and I was told that I was going to get his personal appointment to the Naval Academy. In those days, it was all political. Trust me, they didn't look at my grades. I tried to tell my fraternity brothers about how happy I was that I was going to go to the Naval Academy, and all of them, without fail, said, are you crazy? It's hard up there. Academics, you're going to have to work. You're not used to working. You're not going to work. You can't make good grades here. Where are you going up there? So I went back home, got ready to go in June of 1958, and as I was approaching time to go, my dad calls me in and he said, son, I know you're going to do it, give it your best shot, but if you don't make it, we'll welcome you home with open arms. Said another way, serious doubt in his mind as to whether I would make it, but importantly, it was also a pass for me to fail. So I traveled up to the Naval Academy and I got myself situated up there. And I remember the exact thought I had in my mind the first time I saw Bancroft Hall, which is the largest dormitory, I think, at that time in the world. I looked up at that thing, I said, what in the world am I doing here? This is crazy. I had all kinds of self-doubt because I had been told by virtually everybody that I wouldn't make it and I began to prove them precisely correct. I started out failing every entrance test that I took, and I found myself in what we call bucket classes. These were classes where they took you and started you off at the bottom and said, okay, you're, you know, you're the dumbest guy in the class. We have to bring you up to this level before we can let you into the class academically. So I was in bucket classes for math. I was in bucket classes for science, I was in the bucket classes for everything. Excuse me. And uh, I wasn't doing very good in bucket classes. But anyway, I made it. And academic year started in September. And I began to fail every course I could take. In October, I came back to my room one afternoon. And there was a note on my desk. The Commandant of Midshipman requests your presence in his office at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Now that's not an invitation, <laughs> that's an order. And it is the one order that one Midshipman Smith never ever wanted to see. Because I knew exactly what he was going to do to me. I knew he was going to send me home. I began thinking about those pigs on the farm down in Alabama that I had to feed every morning, how much I hated that. I began to think about the fact that I was about ready to throw away the best chance I'd ever had. And I began to suddenly really not want to go home. But I went to that office, stood outside his office for probably 15 minutes waiting for him to receive me, and all of these thoughts were going through my head. I went in, and here's this most impressive man I've ever seen, dressed in a beautiful blue service uniform with his ribbons up here, 
Navy Cross on top. That's the second only to the Medal of Honor for heroism in combat. A gold wings up here, beautiful shiny gold wings. He had gray hair that stuck like this all over his head. And he had teeth that came out crooked. And he had a face that looked like a soccer ball had been sitting out in the sun for about 10 years. But he had the kindest, gentlest of lives. And he scared the living hell out of me. <laughs> he said, Benjamin Smith, what is your problem? Well, at the Naval Academy, if you didn't know the answer to a question, you said, I'll find out, sir. And so I got, I'll find, he said, no, no, that's not, the, I, I, I don't want that. What I want to know, Benjamin Smith, is are you having more problems than somebody else. Are you, are you having difficulties with the upper class? Are they giving you a hard time? Well, I thought about that for a minute. <clears throat> and the answer to that was, well, no, not any more so than my other classmates. So all I could say was, no, sir. He said, have you been getting all the help you've asked for from your professors? Well, since I hadn't asked for any help, all I could say to that was, yes, sir. And he said, well, I'm trying to understand, Mr. Smith, why you are failing three subjects and you have a D in the other two and you're only taking five. <laughs> well, I started to think about some smart answer, like, well, maybe I'm spending too much time on the two and make a D in But that didn't make much sense to me then. He looked at me for a minute, and he looked down at these papers on his desk, and I felt like I stood there for about two hours, but probably more like about 10, 15 seconds. And then he said to me the most important four words of my life. He looked up and he said, Ben Chipman Smith, you can do this. You can do this. And I'm giving you 10 days to prove me right. In 10 days, I want you satisfactory grades in all subjects, or I will see you again. Folks, that's the best lesson in leadership I ever got in my life. Compassion. A compassionate man looking at me saying, there's something there. There's a nugget there somewhere. We just got to dig around and find it. And I'm going to give him another chance. There was courage, the other very important aspect of leadership, because of what he had done in World War II. I knew he was a leader. And not only what I would call physical courage, but also moral courage. And he also was a man of character. And he had made a judgment call. And his judgment call was, you can do this. Translated to me, that said, stop listening to all those people who said you would fail and start believing in yourself. Every single successful athlete in the world first has to believe in himself before he does anything or she does anything. That is my message to you today. Believe in yourself. Don't let somebody else tell you what you cannot do. Now I'm not going to stand here and tell you that you can do everything you want to do. I doubt very seriously if you'll be an NFL football player in a linebacker position. They'll smash you like a bug. <laughs> and you're probably not going to be the greatest at, you know, athletic uh, director at the biggest university in the world, because that may not be your bit. <laughs> but if you want to do something, you're never going to succeed unless you believe in yourself. Now, tomorrow morning when you wake up, I want you to look in the mirror. <clears throat> and introduce yourself to the one person in the world who is 100% responsible for who you are and what you will become. We all have challenges. Make no mistake about it. Some of us more than others. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we are responsible for who we are and what we will become. And the first order of business is to believe in yourself. The second order of business is expect to win. And don't ever let anybody tell you you can't. That's my message. I hope it's, I hope it's
God alone. I hope you'll ask me some questions. And I don't care if you're about what I just talked about. <clears throat> you can ask me about raising pigs if you want to. I won't ask that. <laughs> but in any event, I would really enjoy having a little chat with you. Talk about what you want to talk about. So who's going to be the first one to stand up and ask me a question? Aha. Uh -huh. I know once you get started, it'll be like a waterfall. <laughs> Somebody's got to be first. I don't like it. <laughs> you look very anxious over there to raise your hand. You, you want to raise your hand? <laughs> no, you don't. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. So were you ever in a seal? Say that again. Were you ever in a seal? I was never in a seal. I'm not that good. <laughs> I, uh, I've had the very distinct pleasure of working with Navy SEALs, some of them members of SEAL Team 6, which up until a year or two ago was a secret organization. They are, in every sense of the word, the most unique human beings that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. They are physically incredible specimens. That courage that goes beyond my ability to describe. And yet they are as humble as any person I've ever known. You know, there I talked about the three C's, I've got my three C's of leadership. Courage, compassion, and character. You also got to put in there the three, what I call the three H's. Hungry, humble, and honest. I hope that wasn't seal. <laughs> That's fair. Oh, sir, I can't see that far. Okay, now speak up because I'm deaf. Did you ever flew a combat? Yes, ma'am, I did. Uh, I flew a uh, single engine, single seat aircraft <clears throat> off of aircraft carriers. And uh, I flew 282 combat missions in Vietnam. I never got shot down. Got hit one or two times. Um, a quick story. When you're on a, an aircraft carrier, you get ready to take a catapult shot. That's what throws you into the air. You go from, some of you guys might like this, you go from zero to about 165 miles an hour in just under two seconds. Yeah, it does. It snaps you back pretty good. But my first night catapult shot <clears throat> was an experience I'll never forget. I told you I, the, the, the words you can do this have come back to me many times over. Well, when you're on a catapult, you run the engine up to full power and have a thing called a holdback fitting and it keeps you from going forward. You're locked into this catapult and you got this throttle full forward and the catapult officer's out there with this wand and waving it around, a green wand, and when you're ready to go, you turn your external lights on. Those are the lights on the air side of the airplane. And you do this with this little finger because the light switch is a little toggle switch on the throttle. So I'm up there at full power and it's black as coal out there at nighttime, the first night catapult shot. And my heart is beating at about 200 beats a minute. And I can't get this little finger to work. It will not turn those lights on. And I, I promise you, I thought to myself about that instance. Captain Brandon's office, and I said, Smith, you can do this. And I turned that light on, and bam! That was the start of a very, very interesting career. Now, I must tell you, as soon as I got off that deck, I thought, boy, you better be right, because you only got this airplane to get it back down on that ship. <laughs> so, yes, I did fly combat. Not fun, uh, and I was one lucky. In this book, A Better Man, I was telling some folks this morning, there's a, there's a chapter nearby, a classmate of mine by the name of Paul Galati. Paul, unfortunately, got shot down very early in the war, and he spent six and a half years in the prison of war. And the last part of his chapter in that book is, if there's a doorknob on the inside, it can't be a bad day. Anything else? Yes, sir. I got one back over here, and I'll be with you in a minute. Come on right over here. Yes, sir. Do you have any regrets? Did I ever do what? Do you have any regrets? Yeah. You know, I guess if, if 
if I were to say no, I'd be lying to you, but we all have regrets about something we've done in life. There have been people in my life that I've not treated very well, and I'll regret that. There have been opportunities that I've been presented with that I have not taken advantage of, and I regret that. Um, but overall, somebody asked me one time, did you enjoy what you did? And I said, I cannot imagine having done anything else in my life. So I'm pretty happy with what it turned out. Now, back in the booth, we got another couple of guys that I saw a hand up back there. Have you been anywhere else besides Vietnam? Uh, well, I, I've been to the country club down here in Whispering Pine. <laughs> So, I, you know, I've had a very exciting life. I've, I've uh, just about been around the globe. I, we've, I've been in, I can't tell you how many cruises I make, Paige, how many cruises did I make, I don't remember, but I had, I had three cruises to Vietnam. Uh, we had two, two uh, to the Mediterranean. I had one ship that I took into the uh, North Arabian Sea. I, I spent two years in Germany as a director for operations during some very exciting times over there. I was just reading a book last night, or the night before last, called Exceptional. Uh, and it, it's about, it talks about some of the things that went on during the Cold War. And I was there when the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and it was quite an interesting time in those days. Uh, I was also there when we started up the war in Iraq the first time. That was interesting. So I've had some very, very interesting times, and I've been a lot of different places. I, I was in Bosnia. We had a terrible time there. Uh, yeah, lots of fun places. Yes, sir. I'll get to him. You, you first, and you can. Yes, ma'am. Did you hear him? Spy plate? I can't tell you that. I'd have to shoot you. <laughs> No, my mission, is, uh, uh, my mission was uh, what do you call it, attack. We hung bomb on the airplane, flew on the targets, and dropped them off. So, no. I did not fly any spy plane. Sir? What's the best way to describe uh, trapping your aircraft on the carrier? A controlled crash. <laughs> It, it, it's, it, it, it's at one, at one time one of the more frightening things you'll do, and it, it, it's the instant after you land and, and you know you're trapped, it's the most exhilarating feeling in the world. And the harder it was to get there, the, the more exhilarating. The tough ones are when the deck is moving, you know, it, that's, that gets pretty dicey when the deck's moving up and down 30 or 40 feet, and it's nighttime and raining. Uh, then you, you know, then you got to dig deep and you got to come up with whatever it takes to get aboard you. You'll tell yourself a lot of times on it as you're making approaches to that thing, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, and you just pray you can. But no, it's, uh, I can remember some nights in, in my life that I'm just as soon as not been in an airplane trying to get aboard the carrier. But I can also remember the feeling when I did it. Uh, yes, let's see. You had your hand up first, I think, and then we're going to go right back to you. Yes, ma'am. Let's do the, the two questions that you said. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, it was in October, I mean, uh, March. March? March? March of 1997. <laughs> I was, uh, I had that command, and when I was in Bosnia, and before that, as a commander in chief of the Allied Forces, something that's a NATO command. I don't want to get into all that, except I had British forces under my command, and there were some interesting times. And, and the, the Minister of Defense and the Chief of the Military in the, in the United Kingdom felt that I had done a reasonably good job, and so they recommended to Her Majesty the Queen that she give me this honor, and it was one of the biggest honors I've ever seen. And uh, we went into her office to uh, to receive the papers and, and I had been told that she was a very soft spoken lady and that I should wear my hearing aids and you have already told you I can't hear you. So I, I put on these hearing aids and I had them turned way up and I could have heard everything in the world. <laughs> and uh, we went to Buckingham Palace, my wife and I did and, and we were briefed and she would be briefed about me, she would know everything about me, she would carry the conversation with me, relax and whatnot. So we went up to Buckingham Palace, up to the second floor, to a private office, and I'm standing there, and this big, tall, Royal Navy Lieutenant Commander said, I don't time. He opens these two doors, and we, we walk in behind him. He says, Your Majesty, Admiral Mr. Smith. He backs up. I walk over. She says, Hello, I don't know what Well, she had been briefed because I was as deaf as a post. And though I make fun of this, it was indeed an honor. But she, she, we were in that office for about 17 18 minutes and I felt like my head was going to come off my shoulders every time she said anything. Delightful time. We had one more question over here in the booth. Yes, sir. Do you think you'll ever go back to a place like Vietnam where you fought to like tour it? I've never been back. I think you asked if I've ever been back as a tourist. And the answer to that is no. I, I've not. I've had a lot of my friends go back and they tell me that the Vietnamese are just very warm, uh, very I want to say forgiving people because some of them suffered mightily because of some of the things that we did. Uh, you need to know war is not pretty. There ain't nothing exciting about war. There's nothing, there's nothing about war that's good. But sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes you have to do things that are not terribly pleasant. And I would not invite you to seek opportunities to fight a war, but if it comes, then some people, you know, somebody's got to go do it. But no, the people in Vietnam are, are very kind and gracious, and, at least the, the people that I know that have gone back. I, I've got to tell you that I'm impressed with the school. Uh, I just, I can't tell you how, how happy I was to be able to come out here and talk to you this morning. I wish you all the very best of everything. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity.